Uh... <laughs> Astronomy Cast, episode 428, Moons of Mars. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane, I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Very well. I, I believe you're, by the time a person is listening to this, you're probably on the West Coast somewhere. Some kind of meetup happening, maybe? Um, by the time they listen to this, not quite yet. So on, on uh, December 14th, which is a Wednesday, we are going to do a meetup in San Francisco at my favorite random dive food place in San Francisco. It's uh, 2832 Mission Street, and it's called uh, Rosamund's. It's a sausage and craft brew place, because really, who doesn't want sausages and craft brew on a plate filled with random things like sauerkraut? Um, right. So it's a fabulous place. They have big wooden tables where we can sprawl and talk and eat and drink and enjoy life and so yeah go sign up uh we have it up on universe.com events just search for san okay. francisco and cosmoquest and hey we will see you in san francisco and i think we're all sold out of the eclipse trip right we are totally sold out okay. and there's an impressive wait list okay so we kept nagging you get on it quickly and now we're all a sold out so uh thanks everyone who's joining us and i don't know we'll try to figure something out maybe i don't know there'll uh, be other events in the future yeah so we begin a mini series on mars how many episodes will we do who knows who cares but today we start with a discussion of the two martian moons phobos and deimos uh okay great pamela good choice i i couldn't uh, agree more with uh with these moons where should we begin what are they uh good question we don't totally know the answer to they are two lumpy potato shaped low density probably piles of rubble that are orbiting in suspiciously circular orbits around mars with compositions that look a lot like a uh chondrous chondrite Carbonaceous chondrite, to get all the syllables in the word. And for those who aren't perhaps steeped in meteorite lore, a carbonaceous chondrite is? They're rocks. They're not metal. They're rocks, not metal. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, I really appreciate the precise scientific terminology, <laughs> and then we can follow that up with something a little more, you know, down to earth. So <laughs> this is how, how I, I keep them straight in my head. It's is at the end of the day, your average everyday rock, were it sent through space and, and allowed to come back down towards Earth, it would resemble a carbonaceous chondroit, but with planetary, each object at a different distance from the sun has slightly different ratios of the stuff that goes into it. So, so carbonaceous chondroits, um, they're, they're, they're things that have carbon in them. They have organic compounds, silicate, oxides, sulfurs. They're, they're rocks. I, it, it, sorry, it, right. they're rocks. Well, the, but I mean, the part that's kind of amazing is, is that they are so similar to the asteroids that you find across the solar system. And yet you said they have a suspiciously circular orbit. Yeah, so I, I don't know about you, but when I was little, um, what I was taught in school, which so much of what we were taught was wrong, um, so but, wrong. but what I was taught was, was Phobos and Deimos were most likely captured asteroids. And that made for a great story lumpy potato shaped small these things are only a, a couple of dozen ish kilometers um so so seemed like a good story but the problem is that if they were like an everyday captured asteroid they would have been an object that was happily in orbit around the sun going along in a nice friendly orbit minding its own business and then mars gravity said hi i like you and sucked it over and didn't let go and in the process of doing this 
because they would have started with two different orbits, they would have started with different velocities. The, the moons, what are now moons, Phobos and Deimos, would have ended up in these highly elliptical orbits. And, and it's possible to imagine that over time, things and stuff happened that, that interacted gravitationally with the two objects and caused them to, over time, get more and more circularized orbits. But as near as we can tell, not enough time has passed for that to, to have happened as thoroughly as it currently appears to be circularized. So this is a bit fright, fright, not frightening. It's a bit frustrating if you're trying to figure out where did these things come from. And a little weird that they both have a very circular orbit. Like if one had yeah. a fairly circular orbit and the other one was highly elliptical, then you could think that one was captured and one was born in, in place. Okay, so, so the source originally was thought that they were captured asteroids. Now people are leaning towards they were formed in place. Science or is still out. Yeah, there, there's a bunch of, of different theories. The one that you run across most often, I think, is um, that at some point in the past, Mars had a big old ring around it, uh, formed in place. Or I've also seen arguments of it once had a bigger moon. That bigger moon ended up through tidal forces crashing into the surface of Mars. Um, or getting broken apart, or something catastrophic happened that ended up with things in orbit that ended up as Phobos and Deimos. Um, so there's a whole lot of violent ideas. One of the ones that I find particularly interesting just to think about, but that doesn't mean it's high probability, it just means I think it's cool to think about, is once upon a time Mars had a swarm of asteroidish moons and through many, many interactions over time, um, it was like, who is the weakest link? And they threw out of orbit all but these two that ended up in circularized orbits. What about like just a crazy collision, right? You know, like because like, with the because with the Earth, right? We had uh, you know this this Theia object that collided with the Earth way back in the in the day and created the Moon in place, and it has a roughly circular orbit. It's not so bad. And, and this is where you see uh, theories that range from either there was a big moon in the past, and by big I mean in comparison to the size of Mars, uh, that crashed into the surface of Mars or got tidally shredded, or there was a completely external object that collided and you ended up with Phobos and Deimos getting hurled up or a cloud of stuff that formed Phobos and Deimos actually is what would have happened. Um, and this actually seems to kind of align with the idea that perhaps the lowlands on Mars are actually a giant crater. There's all sorts of interesting things that you can get at through mathematical models. But the truth is, at the end of the day, we need to go pick up rocks just about everywhere, compare their compositions, and sort this out compositionally. So the only way we're going to know is if we actually send a spacecraft. Send lots of lots spacecrafts of and pick up lots of rocks. I'm a fan of, of picking up yeah, rocks. Yeah, and, and, and study them. That makes sense. Uh, okay, so can you see these moons, like, if you have a pretty good telescope? Like, what does it take to be able to actually spot them? And how were they first discovered? So, so what's cool is... First of all, I love where they were found. They were actually found at Foggy Bottom, which is now a, I believe it's an FBI training facility out on the East Coast. Um, and and they, they were discovered in 1877 at the U.S. Naval Observatory um, facility, which has since moved. It's not in the same place anymore. And they were found with, I believe it was a 20-something inch telescope. I'm flipping through my notes trying to find the exact size of this telescope. It, it was the kind of thing where when you look at what modern telescopes are capable of doing, um, you could totally do it with a modern backyard 20-inch telescope today. A modern, like a, a modern backyard 20-inch telescope? Yeah, well, if they're a thing, you can get them on Orion. Yeah, a plane wave. No I, yeah, so go to Oceanside Photo and Telescopes. Yeah. And, Order the 20-inch uh, telescope. Spend the amount of money that you would yeah. normally spend on a car on your telescope, um, and yeah, you can you can totally buy your own monster telescope. That sounds good. Uh, okay, so so you've got this uh, 
you know, these two moons discovered, it, it was like, what, a, a couple hundred years ago? When were they discovered? It, it was actually, it wasn't that long ago. It was 1877. They were discovered just a couple of days apart. It was basically an August observing run. Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure how to say his name because it's an older style name. Asaph Hall, I think is how you say his name, um, discovered them. He thought he saw a moon on August 10th, 1877, but the weather was kind of bad, so it wasn't a confirmed discovery. But uh, he, he was there with observing time to look for moons. This is why he was observing. And um, sure enough, he was able to confirm moons on um, the, the 18th was when uh, – he found Phobos and um, sorry, I'm going to re-say this so that it sounds better on, on microphone. I'm, I took bad notes is what I'm currently learning. This is where you get to watch the, the sausage being made. Okay. Now I have my notes organized by order, not Did by you get that Chad. There was an edit. Yes. There. Okay. Sorry, Chad. Um, okay. <laughs> so, so I'm going to, going to apologize for how I pronounce this poor astronomer's name. It's an older style name. I believe it's pronounced Asaph Hall. And he was looking in August. The first one, he thought on August 10th that he'd seen a moon, but the weather was bad. So it wasn't a confirmed discovery, but he was Foggy using bottom. it. It's the appropriate name. Yeah. Um, so, so he kept looking. He was there to find moons. And... On the night of August 12th, he saw Deimos, and then on the night of August 18th, that was when Phobos became the the second moon that we had discovered. And <coughs> and what's cool is these these are objects that lots of people thought had to exist as a pair of objects for reasons that had nothing to do for, with science for many many years. What reasons? <laughs> so, so why, why i mean like because they thought there was going to be canals on the surface of of mars like it's it's no super... that came later that was percival Lull. no the 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 i kid you not logic behind this was mercury has has no moons venus has no moons earth has one moon and at the time of discovery um jupiter, jupiter had four four right so it was a mathematical sequence, one, one, two, four. And, and via that logic, um, and there were things like in, in uh, Gulliver's Travels, Swift had two moons around Mars, Voltaire in later writings that were considered to be inspired by Swift had two moons of Mars. It was just kind of a given. Mars has two moons. Um, I love how logic works. I'm, I'm not going to stop looking until I find both moons of Mars. Yeah. Yes. That's awesome. Uh, right. Okay. So so now, you know, but I mean, I'm just trying to think about like their sort of modern orbits, the what we kind of know now. They have very interesting orbits around the around the planet, Phobos especially. Yeah. So so let let's start with Deimos, which is somewhat simpler. So so Deimos is. Um, not quite in synchronous orbit. It's close. If you want to build a space elevator, it is not totally insane to imagine if you wanted to move a potentially unstable object, uh, moving Deimos and making a space elevator, the problem is Phobos would be in the way. So actually, that's a bad idea. Well, Phobos um, is going to take care of that problem in a couple of million years. So yeah, so 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 you have Deimos. It's it's in an orbit that is only slightly longer than a Martian day. So it's just over thirty hours. Martian day is just over the length of our day. Um, so it it actually just seems like the the moon is is not all that far from staying in the exact same place overhead as the planet rotates if you're not paying a whole lot of attention. Um, so it actually goes a couple of days before it appears to set. Right. So it slowly moves across the sky bit by bit and then sets and then a while later it, it rises again. Relative to your place on the right. surface of the planet. So as yours are going night to day, night to day, it's it's trying to to 
basically tag along so that it takes it half half a day to for you get halfway across the sky so that rising it, it's crazy but it at least is doing the rise in the east set in the west thing yeah. now phobos phobos it's just is crazy su- talk phobos super weird yeah so phobos is is orbiting faster than than mars is is rotating and and the side effect of this is you can sort of imagine if you have a child on the most pathetic merry-go-round ever that if you're running around the merry-go-round the child will perceive you to be rising and setting in the opposite direction as someone who's just standing in place beside the merry-go-round right but I, but I mean, I think that the thing that's interesting, right? So you would see it, it would be rising Rise in the west. wrong place. It would go quickly across the sky and then in rise again direction. in the wrong place because it is, it is orbiting faster than the day. Yeah, which is which is mind bending. And and one of the side effects of this orbiting in the wrong direction it's orbiting in the correct direction it appears to move across the sky in the wrong direction it's it's strictly an optical illusion i swear to god it is orbiting in the correct direction right now one of the side effects of this is where like our moon is happily moving away from the earth at a few centimeters per year um it's it's not quite such a happy story for Phobos. Right. Phobos is actually getting about a meter closer to Mars every 50 years, two meters closer every 100 years, and in 30 to 50 million years, about the time Earth becomes uninhabitable, it's going to get tidally torn apart and potentially do all kinds of badness to the orbital area around Mars by forming a ring. And then smash into the planet eventually yeah that's that's so this whole backup system of putting humans on mars has a few problems but i love this i love this idea right like with our moon because the moon is takes 28 days to go around the earth it is it is you know that that orbit that takes longer than a single 24-hour period means that the moon is slowing down the earth's rotation speed and it is slowly drifting away to compensate and whenever wherever we see this in the solar system if you get that you know that same mechanism will play out again and again this tidal locking that happens but if you get a moon that is within the day period of the its planet then it's the opposite cycle that it is speeding up the rotation of its host planet and it is drifting closer to the planet to compensate and in the end it must crash into the into the home planet and so phobos is doomed and when you think about i mean just to go back to that idea that phobos has been around for for 4.6 billion years like the rest of the it objects take. well our yeah, moon is only been around four, like- yeah less than four so i mean we don't know quite know when it was sure sure but in billions of years right that we are here for the final 50 30 to 50 million years of its life which is just another just an amazing coincidence that all the other moons and and sorry like i know i'm you know i'm going on a rant this is what i find this so interesting and fascinating that that i you know i'll go back to some questions in a second but that that this probably happened across the solar system many of the times but they're all gone now because they all crashed into their planets like they think they're supposed to and and phobos is like the last one to sort of follow in with that crowd i find this concept just just mind-bending i love it well and there's a certain amount of fabulous poetic justice going on because well so so mars is named after uh the god Ares, just instead of using the Greek version, they used the Roman version. And in naming Phobos and Deimos, they they went for um, basically uh, the the children of Mars. So you have Phobos, which means panic and fear. So so the moon that is going to be shredded is the moon of panic and fear. And if I knew my destiny was to be gravitationally shredded by my father. 
which is mythologically what we're talking about here, panic and fear would be entirely the right things to right. tie my creation. Perfect. Uh, now, before it gets destroyed and takes out a goodly portion of the uh, Martian, uh, the terraformed Martian future, uh, Phobos is a nice place to visit, and it and it's a place. It's been a target of space exploration, a failed space exploration, but it still has some really intriguing uh, properties, right? So, so the the Soviet Union, Russia did did try, try, try being the optimal word, um, Mars curse, uh, did try and go there failed two spacecraft died uh both really due to like mistakes so it was human intervention caused space death um but we have some pretty amazing pictures of, of Phobos and Deimos thanks to other orbiting spacecraft that orbited fairly close. There was just no successful landing on them. And and so the thing with with Phobos that makes it so tantalizing is it is the larger of the two objects. It's close enough to the surface of Mars that you can do the whole fly by wire thing with your robots. And since it's zipping around so frequently, um, you, you can't pay direct attention to one robot continuously for an entire day, but you're gonna keep coming back to that sucker. And its, it's dimensions are, 27 by 22 by 18 meters when you kind of sum up the fact that it's this kilometers. Super, it, kilometers, yes, kilometers. 27 by 22 by 18 kilometers. Pretend it's a rectangle. It's a weird-shaped potato. Um, this, this is big enough to be interesting uh, to be able to imagine finding a fairly good landing site on. Now, this is a highly porous object. This means there's a lot of empty cavities inside as near as we can tell um the surface regolith doesn't seem to have a lot of water from spectroscopic measurements but that isn't to say that there isn't potentially frozen volatiles stuff that would melt gases water deeper down in phobos and the gravity is super low you would weigh less than 1000 times what you weigh now so let's say you weighed a thousand pounds on earth neither of us weigh that we're quite grateful. But say you did, your weight on Phobos would be about half a pound. Right. Which is awesome. Well, as we learned with the Rosetta mission, attempting to interact with that kind of microgravity is <clears throat> incredibly difficult. And the slightest movements will kick you off into space. It's a, it's a bad scene. It's it's not as bad as Rosetta. So with Rosetta, your typical human being would weigh about what a sheet of paper weighs. You and I both weigh more than 2,000 sheets of paper. And so you do have added gravity that you'd have on that particular comet. Um, so yeah, it's bad news in terms of you can easily hurl stuff off the surface. The, the escape velocity is... Uh, it's just 11 meters per second. So a good golf ball swing, you're gone. Yeah. Um, but you wouldn't be able to jump time. off, though. I don't think you can, I don't think any anyone can jump 11 meters per second. Well, on Earth gravity, you can't. I don't know here, but it's, it's kinetically messy, ergonomically messy. Right, right. And messy is good in this case. So... The nice thing is you go, you land, you maybe, maybe not have water deep down if you dig through the regolith, but even if you don't, you can imagine sending, just like people talk about doing with Mars, sending your supplies ahead of time, land on Phobos, do your remote reconnaissance, you have real-time ability to explore. You don't have to worry about the germy bugs that human beings carry getting off you and killing things because Phobos is dead. We're all pretty confident in this. So the the plague upon Mars fear that we have with putting people on Mars isn't a problem with Phobos. So we can work to maintain the not actually pristine, but not terrible surface conditions for Mars life as invaded by human robots um, by putting the human beings close, but not actually there. Right. And Phobos provides this wonderful 
halfway point to Mars in terms of just the amount of velocity that you're going to need. You get to Phobos, go to the hollowed out space dock that Pamela has has been planning for decades now. Uh, you get more landing fuel, whatever you need to do, visit with the, uh, the future colonists, and then make your way down to the surface of Mars. Want to leave Mars, fly up, dock at Phobos, pick up more fuel, head for home. It's a really great – having these these objects are very useful for space exploration in the future. And as you said, a great place to observe the surface of Mars without actually having to go down and stand on the surface of Mars. Yeah. And and so all in all, it it seems like a kind of ideal option minus the whole we don't know how to get there without dying problem. But I think that's where we're going for the next couple of episodes. Yeah, that's exactly it. We're going to be talking about getting to and from Mars. And so this is going to play into our into our future uh, plans. Does would Phobos work? As one of, like, I, you know, I'm half joking about this, but, you know, as one of your, like, let's take an asteroid, hollow it out, spin it up. Would Phobos do the trick? It's pretty big, right? So so the real issue is uh, it, it may be a rocky, a rocky pile of rubble that is loosely held together gravitationally, and taking something that's loosely held together and spinning it up seems like a really bad idea. So, um, no, I would not spin it up until we knew a lot more about how well it was gravitationally held together. Um, when you spin something, you add all sorts of extra forces uh, that do not help it hold together. And, of course, we've got this problem of it getting lower and lower to Mars and eventually crashing into the surface of the, of the planet, which, which would be a, a very bad day. Yeah. But what's cool is when you look at, at the pictures of, of Phobos, it's covered in these deep grooves that can, if you trace them back, they're traced back to probably four different events in time by looking at, at the directions of them. And it's thought that these grooves are created by stuff other than Phobos or Deimos hitting Mars, throwing debris up, and then poor Phobos had to plow through the debris. So... Phobos has already had its life ruined by Mars many times. So again, we're looking at poetic justice here. And one of the other ideas as well is that there might be water under the surface of Phobos. So once again, there's one of the rarest substances that, you know, in the inner solar system is water. It may very well be that you can find it under the surface on, on Phobos, which would make getting to and from Mars again easier, like a refueling station right there. And, and if you haven't ever seen a good image of, of Phobos, Google uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and Stickney Crater. Stickney Crater is the largest crater on Phobos, and it's, it's near this crater that all of these grooves that aren't necessarily associated with the crater happen to exist. And, and these, these are some truly stunningly beautiful, wow, that object has had a bad life kind of images. I'm able to show an image here for the for the people watching us live, uh, but but yeah, you're gonna have to just you're gonna have to do this for yourself. Uh, there we go. And while he's pulling that up, as we're running out of time, I do want to throw in a correction for a past episode. On the episode where we talked about uh, naming telescopes, I incorrectly said, based on an argument I heard scientists having, that Hubble wasn't named Hubble until after launch. And someone who actually works on, well, worked past tense and is now a friendly, awesome emeritus person, um, reminded me, no, no, actually it was named prior to launch which happened when I was mostly interested in marching band in high school. I'm very sorry for the mistake. I will, for now, from now on, reference check people who have interesting arguments in front of me. <laughs> right, okay. All right, well, so like I said, this is the beginning of a multi-part episode series on Mars. How many are we going to do? Who knows? We'll do that until we, until we run out of the topics that we want to talk about. We've got some interesting ones uh, coming up next week, we're going to be talking about getting to Mars, I think. I think tomorrow is living on Mars because getting Mars, to Mars right. doesn't have an answer. Yep. So we're going to talk about living on Mars and getting back from Mars because we don't Mars. know how to get there safely without death. That's right. 
and uh, other topics I'd like to talk about. So this sounds great. All right. Thanks, Pamela. Bye-bye. Don't actually leave, everybody. This is where we save and then answer your questions. And I apologize for the sniffing and snot and coughing into my microphone. I, I got seriously sick. Like I don't remember last week. Kind of oh, sick. Really? Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so let's see. What what did I say this episode was? Four twenty eight. Four twenty eight. Okay. <coughs> and I'll export that. The other thing that's interesting about Phobos is that there's a portal to hell on it. One percent of the audience series? just got that joke, or that reference. Which sci-fi series? At Doom. The video. Oh, game. video game. Yeah. Okay. On the video game Doom, you're you're on a space station on Phobos, uh, battling a portal to hell. Okay, <clears throat> a bunch of questions. Uh, you ready? Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, Empire Hexmac wants to know, how can we live on Mars when storms are coming? So, so that whole thing in the Martian where there's this massive storm of death, even, even we're admits it's really not that bad because the, the air pressure is pretty low. So um, low pressure air, it, it's not an issue. You just sort of go, hi, wind, you're pretty, and yeah. you stay inside. Yeah, like even a massive hurricane, you couldn't even fly a kite in it. It'd be sad. Um, okay. Uh, a really big kite you could. Yeah, and in fact, there's there's ideas of like airplanes and stuff on Mars because the gravity is lower, so you could yeah pull it off. Um, but, yeah. but it's it's not the issue that, that we're used to here. Uh, so there is uh, ice – so – in a video I talked about recently, I talked about how there's ice water at the poles of Mars, and someone else has mentioned there's frozen carbon dioxide. The poles of Mars have both, right? The, the carbon dioxide mm -hmm. forms as snow in the Martian winter, but the, the water ice caps are there all year, and in fact are yep. even under the ground quite a ways, almost nearing the equator on Mars. And then every wintertime, it snows carbon dioxide, which would be – Crazy. Awesome. Yeah. Can you, what would we like to ski on for, on carbon dioxide? Probably terrible, actually. Well, yes. Because it, it doesn't melt, right? So it doesn't – you don't get that layer of, of melt. Yeah. You can't ice skate on carbon dioxide. It doesn't work. Yeah. Um, what, what, what's super cool to be horribly punny, but I didn't mean to be. I'm a child of the 80s. Cool is the word that comes out of my mouth, um, is, is – your atmospheric density actually changes with temperature as the carbon dioxide freezes out. That's just. Uh, which movie? Seth Cooper wants to know which movie is more accurate, Mission to Mars or The Martian? The Martian. The Martian, like a thousand times. Mission, Mission to Mars? Oh, I'm just like, is that the one with Val Kilmer? I think so. NASA actually kind of went, Andy Weir, company, come, we shall help you. And and there was a whole lot of, of extra access given to help make sure that the movie was done well. Yeah, this is the one. No, Gary Sinise and uh, Tim Robbins. Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah, it was no good. All kinds of problems. Uh, no, The Martian. Martian is like the greatest science-related or space proper science, space science related movie that we've ever had. It's like anything. Compare what, what, anything to the Martian and the Martian wins. What I love is anyone asks you for a book or movie recommendation, even if you know they've already seen or read it, you recommend yeah. the Martian. I you were looking for a book to read. I recommended the Martian. And you, and you know I've read it. Oh, I didn't know you've li but you listened to the audio book. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Never mind then. Uh, hey everybody, Pamela needs some book recommendations, by the way. So if you can recommend some audiobooks for her, 
uh like audible you have an audible account yeah yeah i had i've been a member of audible since before people knew what audible was and my goal this weekend this this is so lame my goal this weekend is to clean my house and listen to audiobooks and take a break from reality that sounds fun um Carolyn B. asks, are there many global dust storms on Mars like the one Mariner 9 saw? Would they affect the landers? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and they affect them in two different ways. During the storms, limited power because you don't get as much sunlight. However, during the storms, all the dust that accumulates on the, the solar panels gets blown off. So it's, it's good and bad. Yeah. Um... Will Phobos make it? Tom Andrews wants to know: Will Phobos make it to the surface or break up into much smaller chunks before impact? Oh, it will break up. It's yeah. going to shred, ring. Yes, no yep. direct impact. It is not that sturdy of an object. It'll go through the Roche limit, be torn into a ring, and then the individual pieces of the ring will smash into the planet, like uh, seven Eves. Have you? How about seven Eves? Oh, Seven Eves. Yeah. Yes, I loved that book. Yeah. There, there is someone with the username Confuzzled Gamer, which is just kind of fabulous, who, who strictly because of the name, I'm going to answer his question. Um, haven't read the question yet. Hopefully it's good. Uh, do the Martian moons cause plate tectonics or are they too small? They're too small. They're yeah. tiny. They're the the moon doesn't little. cause plate tectonics, though, on Earth, right? No, but there is a small link between um, minor earthquakes and having the moon straight overhead. So it does have an effect on the existing plate tectonics. Um, John Suffield is asking, why can't we put some kind of wiper on the solar panels to clear them of dust? Because it would scratch Energy. them up, right? But well, it, no, the bigger issue is how do you power those suckers? And then they add weight and mm -hmm. just let the wind do it. Yeah. Just let the wind do like it. we don't even have to, we don't have to worry about it. It's awesome. The, the, the uh, little dust devils are cleaning off the dust on the, on the solar panels. It's fantastic. Um, Yuriko Roberto wants to know what's the best TV series that features Mars? Have you seen The Expanse? No. No? Oh. See the watch the expanse. You'll love it, and they it's do a pretty TV good show job. or a movie. It's a TV show. It's a series. It's based on okay. uh, a book series, and it was on the Sci Fi Channel. And they did a great job of of showing sort of the future of human colonization of the solar system. Yeah, fantastic. The Expanse. I'm sure you've even heard of it. Like, oh yeah, I wanted to watch that show. Yeah, I'm it's still trying to get through. Season two of Mr. Robot and season one of Strange Things. Uh, season two of Mr. Robot, don't bother. Watch Stranger Things for sure. Yeah, that's my Oh, one. The Expanse is not on Netflix. Let's see if it's on Hulu. Um, and it's coming back in 2017, which is awesome. Yeah, I love The Expanse. That was like, that was like someone made me a surprise present. Um, just got a sound spike. Okay, so it's not the cable. Thanks for helping me uh, figure this out. <coughs> and my Google Assistant just popped open. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, okay. I'm going to have to buy. So Larry Beckham wants to know: Would Martian dust be as toxic as lunar dust? Um. So so lunar dust isn't so much toxic because it's poison as it's horrific because it's silica and will shred your lungs it's little so put it in of glass i'm gonna get a picture of yes. this stuff is awful put it in the category of asbestos and nanoparticles in your head so lunar dust is just evil um martian dust there's a whole lot more weathering so there's the potential that it's going to be a whole lot more rounded but I don't know if it's enough that it won't destroy your lungs. Um, so like the, the reason that dust in the air during a dust storm in Phoenix or uh, Africa or China 
um, I don't know why I picked on Phoenix rather than like the entire American Southwest. Um, that dust is extremely well-rounded. So it's evil, it will sandblast things, but in general, it won't kill you the way inhaling too much lunar dust probably would over time. Yeah. Um, I'm putting up a picture I, I, of the lunar dust just on the for yeah. the live stream. Um, and just to remind everyone, so look at house this dust is mostly you. So house dust is is human skin cells, dog dander, random plaster bits from your ceiling, and dust mites, which look at those under a microscope sometime and wow, you will be afraid to breathe, but that's what you're breathing and why you should replace your pillows. And one of the most terrifying things I ever learned, this is now me going on a rant, the reason that mattresses seem to weigh more every time you move is because they actually do, because they're oh. filling up with dust mites. Oh. Lovely. Replace your mattresses often, folks. Yeah. Casper. Hey, hey, there you go. Casper, that was for free. Yeah, we, we did that out of love for the lungs of the people in our lives. Yeah, so I'm putting up a picture of what this stuff looks like. And it is just like spiky and it's asbestos right it gets into your uh into your body and into your lungs and it just tears it up and this stuff gets everywhere i mean this was this was the thing that they were talking about on you know when the 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 apollo astronauts were on the moon they just had this stuff just it was in everything it was everywhere it was awful and yeah. and so you can imagine future lunar explorers they're going to come back inside the stuff's going to be on their shoes it's going to get up into the air they're going to get lung cancer from this so well and and this is why when you look at what the desert rats are doing to test future spacecrafts future spacesuits their spacesuits that you like slide into hatch goes down yeah and so the spacesuits basically dangle off the outside of the, spa of the rover um so that you never have to come inside wearing a spacesuit um david joseph wesley just wrote dust in the wind by kansas just became a lot more violent of a yeah. song and that me. right so with mars the because there's this weathering because there's wind these gentle uh you know uh, from the from the global dust storms, this stuff is blowing around all of the uh, the particles and and weathers them and smooths them out and makes them less deadly. On that respect, that said, the Martian dust does have perchlorates in it, so it is actually poisonous. So you know, you give and take. Um, Poison toxin. Um, Joe Lynn asks, would you want to live on Mars if you could? I actually just got this question in my question show this week. So would you live on Mars if you could? I, if I could readily come back or I was close to the end of life anyways, sure. Yeah, exactly. So would I want to visit Mars? Absolutely. But would I want to go and, and live on Mars? Absolutely not. No, thank well, you. so I can imagine like late 70s, retired to Mars, but there's like so much stuff. I haven't seen Petra yet. I mean, it's it sounds right. dumb. Yeah. So much stuff left that I want to see that I can't imagine just confining my place to myself to one place that is isolated in communications time from Earth for for until I've gotten more things off my bucket list. Yeah, no, I like things like like rivers and oceans and birds things like that you know there's a lot of g great things that we have that mars just doesn't have so i'm going to visit mars i don't want to live there i'm uh, you know that's that's it and so i think uh, for a lot of people that idea of colonizing and um pushing yourself to your limits and eking out a life in a hostile environment there's a sense of adventure and I totally support and enthusiastically applaud anyone who wants to do that. It's just not, not for me. I, I, you know, I have these like romantic notes. Like, wouldn't it be cool to like buy a place in the, you know, and buy some land and build your house? And I'm like, I know I won't do that. I, I, I haven't even, you know, updated my roof in a while, and I don't even, you know. I haven't mowed the lawn in a while, so I'm just I'm not a I'm not a build my own construct my own life kind of person. 
Yeah. I get it. Yeah. I like internet. I like the Casper bed. You know, things like that. <laughs> so, yes. uh, th- there you go, Casper. That's another one for you. Remember, they didn't pay us to say this. They just pay us in general to say these things in general. So, so we have been so lucky to generally only have sponsors from companies that we like earnestly adore. Like BarkBox got far longer of an ad last week than they paid for because <laughs> I like live for our Bark. Blech. I live for the days the BarkBox box arrives because it's just stupidly fun to watch my dog lose itself in the oh my god oh my god it uh, yeah so yes we actually love our casper mattresses i adore bark box to no end yeah. and yeah but if spacex wants <laughs> to promote you know astronomy cast we'd be happy for that as well we don't use their stuff yet. <laughs> we don't use it yet Yes, but when we do go visit Mars, uh, Michael Meyer is saying that Elon Musk said he'd like to die on Mars, but not on impact, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is right. Um, let's see. We've got time for a few more questions. Um, Charles Beaver, Chris Beaver asks, uh, if Phobos were to break into a ring and collapse onto Mars, would the impacts result in a waistline or would it be more widely distributed? A waistline. Yeah. yeah. So I just it would, love that idea, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it would just k- smash down around the whole planet. And in fact, there are some of these these strings of of crater impacts on on Mars and on the Moon. They're very rare, but you do see them, and that, that's what happens: is you've had some object that came very close, got broken up into a string of particles of of impactors and then second time came around and shoemaker levy nine into the into mars or the moon and created this just this daisy chain of of impacts which is really amazing to see wiki chai too is this really live yes uh, yes well i mean it's like maybe 20 seconds delayed true um seth cooper asks does mars have van allen belts I don't know. Does it have? I mean, logic it, says no because it doesn't have the yeah. magnetosphere. It has a really terrible magnetosphere. So Maven would be the spacecraft to probe it. Yeah. That sounded dirtier than intended. Um, and it's like partly. In fact, there's like pockets of magnetic protection on Mars. Yeah. Um, let's see. Anything else? Uh, <laughs> Empire Hexbex, can we create teleports from Earth to Mars? Uh, we can't create teleports from anywhere to anywhere. So if we could create teleports from Earth to Mars or anywhere to anywhere, then Earth to Mars sounds great. They, they can cause particle tunneling with things of order of magnitude of electrons, which is technically teleporting an electron, yeah. but not that exciting. I, when I think about all of the sci-fi technologies that that we will never that will never be true, uh, the one that I wish we could have the most would be Stargates. Like just be able yeah. to walk through a portal on one location and appear on the other side half a solar system, half a galaxy, half a universe away, that would be the greatest. I do want accurate medical tricorders with the like ability to say, why yes, the reason you're coughing is exactly foo without needing to like put things in places and stuff. Um, but I'm so grateful we do have tablets. That's cool. That's straight out of Star Trek. They're better than yeah. what they had in Star Trek. Oh yeah. I love tablets. Tablets, yes. Uh, Oh, Mike Billings asked a question. Oh, we should have thought of this. Okay, so are there phases of the Martian moons? Would you see? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You just see them radically changing. (laughs) Very quickly, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. because like if Phobos literally zips across the sky, it just goes, I mean, not like as quickly as, say, the International Space Station, but... It's changing few, phases as it goes, yes. Yeah, a, but if, what, like a couple of hours? What's Sorry, what's the orbital period of Phobos? 
Uh, it's it's less than ten hours. So it's gonna cross your horizon in a oh, yeah. in a few hours. Couple yeah. of hours. Changing phases as it goes. Yeah. 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 That would be that would be amazing to see. And changing phases, just like that. Yeah. It's full moon. It's, the, the way to think about it is when we watch satellites go overhead at night, you can you can see as they go through where they can catch sunlight. And and it's that same idea of, of you're watching it catch and change the amount of sunlight it's catching as it goes. Yeah. All right. Well, we should wrap things up. We're sort of reached the end of our time. But don't worry. We're going to be here again tomorrow on our uh, nonstop astronomy cast uh, fiesta. So we'll be doing tomorrow. We're going to be – what are we again talking about? Man. Tomorrow man. is surviving on Mars. Surviving on Mars or not. Or not. Uh, how, to, how to be a Martian. Uh, and then we're going to talk about getting back from Mars. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, Pamela, for bringing the brain. We will see you all tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. Goodbye. Stop streaming.